Hello, and welcome to this special episode of Procurement Reimagined, brought to you by Gatekeeper. We're rounding off this year with a compilation featuring nine leaders in the procurement space who share their insights across different key touch points. Let's dive in. Let's start by listening to Matthew Booth. Matthew is the procurement manager of EPCM Contracts at PM Group. He has 25 years of leadership experience in the procurement space and is passionate about procurement because it creates multiple value points for the organization, from cost and risk mitigation to innovation and sustainability. How could we reimagine supplier relationship management or SRM? Or do we even, or is that the wrong starting point for us? So I would say, let's first pair it back and, and back to basics. So we have to understand and appreciate that value can be derived from having supplier relationship management, but it's less about reimagining it and more about having it implemented properly. One of those topics in procurement that's been talked about for many, many years, well before we were speaking about innovation and sustainability and diversity, uh, we were talking about relationship management, but it's very few organizations that have implemented it and implemented it properly. Part of the reason for that is because you need to be patient. The results don't come overnight. And of course, we're living today in a world where everything happens faster than it did yesterday. So in all honesty, I think it's about not reimagining per se, but actually understanding what it is, how it can value your organization and how you can implement it properly. And that you could say that's reimagining it. Up next is Hannah McDonald. Supplier Operations Lead at Monzo Bank. Hannah is an experienced senior tech, procurement, operations and risk management manager with a demonstrated history of working in high growth organisations. What best practices would you recommend to other procurement professionals? And like, I think you just gave one really sound bit of advice, which is get hot on ESG sustainability and really prioritise that. Is that kind of, would that be the one area you would say to focus on or is there anything else you can think of that maybe is it focus on ops is it get smart with the way in which you can digitalize aspects i'll kind of hand that over to you i think like if i was coming into procurement now and like knowing what i've learned over the last however many years be a really well-rounded procurement professional and have the skills or be willing to learn them that are going to meet the aspiration of the organization that you want to be in so like my background is tech I worked out like I geek out on stuff. Okay. That's a good sweet spot for me to be in, but things like I can understand like how databases work. I've got good understanding of like cloud architecture. I've managed suppliers. I've been an internal account manager and then getting into banking. I've had to like upskill in a different way. So I think like understand like, what do you need to do to be successful in the type of organization that you want to work in? I think for me, like work in a place that you truly love and believe in the mission and that embodies like your own personal values. I think working in that type of environment will really enrich like any personal career in a lot of different ways. So I think like be a multi-skilled person. I think there's, you are much more valuable and I get category management. I think for certain particular things, it's absolutely the right thing to do in particular areas. But I think if you want to work in a tech company or a growth company, like you need to be willing to wear many hats, especially if you join when they're small. Our next guest is Tom Mills, who is the Head of Procurement and Properties at Bibby Financial Services. Tom is a 20-year veteran in procurement who enjoys the buzz of working in the industry. He has managed £100 million budgets and has led procurement teams at companies like Clark's and Nisbet's. Tom describes himself as competitive and target-driven. So fundamentally... We've got the end user. It's their choice about who they use. We shouldn't be stating whether they should go out to competition if they want to single source. Do you, just on that point alone, do you think that's the norm in procurement as professionals? I don't think it is the norm, actually. I've seen a lot of instances where that doesn't happen. But I think that where you can be most effective in procurement is by taking that kind of disassociated role. And by the way, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't have a strong influence and you shouldn't be making sure that you escalate risk. It doesn't mean that you're a passenger in sure. decisions. It means that, you know, ultimately that's where building credibility is key with stakeholders because over time as a build, business builds trust in your process and trust in your knowledge and trust in your expertise, they'll learn more to appreciate and to listen to um, your advice. And then that means you're more effective. Do you know what I love about procurement? It's the psychology element because it's the influence, influence, builds it builds over time it builds through credibility and experience and that doesn't mean that you're going to get the business is going to get everything right and i think for me 
if you are able to disassociate yourself too, it really helps with things like the stress and the pressure and the for sure. I don't know what factor that I talk about. Yeah. Because I think it was only a few years ago, to be fair, that it was something someone, a lawyer told me, that they said, look, if you know that you've done everything you can to spell out the risks and you've documented those and you followed the right process, then your work here is done, kind of thing. Well, actually, because ultimately you can't control. You no, know, like when you were talking about that role of procurement within that sourcing process, my immediate thoughts went to how legal counsel operate within a business. So yeah. legal counsel will make recommendations they will set out yeah. what they think the business should do they have some other obligations under the sra say within the uk that say they have to act in a set way and they yeah. will at times need to stand against what the company states they may want to do if it's illegal so i just want to caveat that in short they will do exactly what you've said they will show what the risks are they will highlight them. they will do everything in their power to mitigate those and this is what i found myself in my contract management roles as well and there is something to be said for that approach it may take time to get it right and i think that's a really good point that you've made there because there will be mistakes if you let the business have i almost don't want to say let the business have but if you align with the business and put more emphasis on them with the sourcing decisions instead of trying to hold it in a silo and say well this is how we do things here there will be mistakes yeah and you know what as well when those mistakes happen i mean i've come across a couple of big ones in my time whereby you can almost point to those mistakes to help justify your need for involvement in future yeah um, rfps today i know that might not sound optimal because you want to get everything right, yeah yeah but i think it's just part of business is that you know, you're not going to get every decision right and there are going to be some times when the business spends money in the wrong way but over time you grow your influence such that there's less bad decisions there's more good decisions and your value spreads and your credibility grows let's welcome gary salter pickle to the show Gary is the procurement lead at John Lewis Partnership. He joins us with over 35 years in leadership roles at organisations like the Milton Keynes Council, London Borough of Brent, and his current role at John Lewis Partnership. If we don't manage risks, well, something's bound to happen at some point that will cost more money than whatever we've saved on that contract value. I've also been thinking about the CFO, sort of just going back to your point of most procurement people, where do they report? To the CFO. And that is my experience as well sometimes in ops but normally they're very closely aligned to that cfo i think the conversation kind of what you're alluding to as well is it kind of needs to come out of these these procurement bubbles and procurement needs to be talking with internally within their own organizations how they can better do things but probably in places and forums like linkedin on twitter is talk to more of these other types of people across the business and really try and figure out what they're interested in. I've been speaking to a few CFOs and there's one CFO on a platform called Substack. He's on LinkedIn as well called CJ. And we've been chatting a bit and it's just really interesting to see his perspectives because you suddenly realize actually they don't just care about cost, but if we're only going to offer up that we can reduce cost, of course, they're just going to take it, right? Does this take a strong sort of vision from a procurement leader or multiple people? all the way down sort of the hierarchy in a procurement team to make this happen. Like, I'm, I'm just trying to think like, how do we get around this kind of issue that we're presented with, which is a lot of good <laughs> insular conversations within procurement communities and groups, but it kind of isn't going anywhere outside of that. Yeah, keep talking. I was going to say, stop talking to yourselves, but no, keep talking, keep talking and keep generating that feel within the procurement bubble. I wonder if we're just not confident enough in it to have actually yeah. gone out and had that conversation wider in that we want to do it. We think we've got the skills to do it. Are we, can we say we're delivering it? And perhaps we're retreating to things that we know that we can deliver and that we have delivered and it's proven already rather than being a bit more audacious in our goals. And saying, actually, well, we haven't delivered this, but we could, and let's go after it. These are saying that we feel we need to deliver first before we message. But I think we just need to be brave and start having those conversations wider. Even on LinkedIn, I would say it's a great network and there's some great procurement people on there, but it's very much procurement people. So in that network, having that conversation. So I guess it is, how do we expand out of there on those platforms. So there is a CFO reading a post about procurement and, re and you know, yeah. they're reading the post about all the great stuff that procurement does. So then they might be asking the question in their organization, is my procurement team doing that? We certainly need to involve the finance CFO team into conversations. I, I really like your point there about like, keep talking about these things openly, keep talking about these things in these communities, because if the CFO does see it, 
that they can then go and make some critical thinking <laughs> decisions within their own business. That could be a really good way to open this up. I still just wonder if the way I'm looking at this is that all of these other responsibilities that we've kind of spoken about or things that procurement teams are doing, if we're not talking to people within our business that we to say that we are doing it, I just think that then for one, never going to know. But we, we're always going to be bombarded by these other things emerging, whether it's, like you said, relationship management, risk management, sustainability, ESG, making sure people are paid fairly in the supply chain, supply chain visibility. That we, we could do a list, you know, 20, 30 more points here. And these things are happening and procurement are kind of just picking them up at the moment and getting on with it. But I don't think they're doing a good enough job internally in saying, actually, we're doing all of this stuff and we're also saving money for the business. But we're doing all of these other things to stop things happening that are bad, whether that's uh, you know, bringing on a supplier that is has some form of modern slavery within. So maybe it's exploiting female workers somewhere in the supply chain, wherever it is. I just think that we're doing these things already. We're not doing a good enough job of explaining internally and then potentially getting the back in to go do more of it. Yeah, I think, yeah, that, I mean, that is a good point. Because part of rebranding is about um, how you communicate your brand as well. I do think is there's a bit of sort of like internal in the procurement department looking at yourselves to say, actually, what do we stand for? What is it we want to deliver? What do we want to believe in? What's the message we want to give? So we've got a clear message and a clear brand. And then it's sort of like ripples from there. We've got real allies within the business who some of the things that as procurement uh, professionals we want to deliver, it's embedded in people's day jobs. So if, if you have an ethics and sustainability team, which we do, uh, working with them really closely, what's their goals? You know, how they want to achieve them? Well, they can't achieve them without procurement's input because you know, scope-free emissions, for example, that's... So you know, all in the supply chain, right? <laughs> Up next, we hear from Jen Barkley, who is the ESG lead at Narta Procurement and Sustainable Solutions. Jen's career in procurement spans over 23 years and she loves what she does. Jen is a strong team leader focused on developing her team members' careers while achieving organizational goals. And I speak to a lot of people in procurement and contract management and EQ, people mention that to me all the time and like, we need to get better at emotional intelligence. And it really does feel like it's a bit of a, a secret weapon in terms of getting things or getting across a message better to not just within your team, but like you say, to marketing, to your CFO, to whoever it's, um, yeah, I really like that. And the 360 degree uh, surveys, I've done those in the past and they are, the one word I always uh, think of regarding those is like they're exposing in like a, in a good way, right? Because uh, to your point, accountability and auth authenticity come out of them. And I say, we're talking about emotional intelligence, right? And we talk about feedback's a gift and I love taking it. No, if when I have to read it, no, I have that's... to have a box of <laughs> tissues and a glass of wine because I'm still... Yeah. going to be upset by some of it. Their feelings aren't facts and my feelings aren't facts. That's their interpretation and my interpretation, but it's their feedback. So I have to take it in the way that it was given. You take these things, you know, that sometimes you have to take things with a grain of salt if you know that you've had a previous run-in with someone and yeah. taking the opportunity, stub the knife in. But if you've got passion and you actually care about your job, you should probably need a box of tissues because when you've put your all into something, if that hasn't landed and that hasn't worked, like that's really tough. And you'll get over it once you've used the tissue in five minutes or 10 minutes or the next day. But caring shows that it's important. So mm. I guess for me, emotional intelligence doesn't mean I'm big and strong and I don't cry. It means you care enough. It's almost the opposite. You it is. Yeah. You know yeah. when to take that as a lesson and not to take it to heart. Thank you, Jen, for your insights on emotional intelligence. Let's now turn to what Ken Adams had to say. Ken is the Chief Content Officer at Legal Sifter, an AI-driven contract management service. He is a specialist in contract language and automation, having spent 34 years across legal and contractual concerns. He has also lectured at the University of Pennsylvania Law School for over seven years. I think it's just a good career lesson in some ways that you've provided small actionable system steps every day and 20 years later you may come up with something amazing <laughs> or you may look back and think oh they had a blast anyway it's all good right just moving on from your book which is wonderful can I ask you to define traditional contract language it just leaves what's in contracts nah. 
which is a stew generated by generations of copy and paste heedlessly. Yeah. So with that legalistic element thrown in, with the result that it is just very hard to make sense of, and if you can make sense of it, and it just it's a drain on everyone's time and resources. So it's just what's out there, and it's yes. Yeah. Whenever, just as you were talking there and talking about the copy and paste side of things, you can just recall just going through so many different SaaS agreements in recent years where they all look fairly similar, right? They all follow a similar pattern. But some of the clauses you can almost tell have been pulled from maybe 10 other SaaS agreements that may be from the bigger companies in the space. Maybe as a startup, they're just trying to find their feet and they come up with this clause, this Frankenstein clause, poor logic very hard to follow. And that's kind of what I was just thinking about there. And I've seen a lot of debate around, you know, is copy and paste bad? Is copy and paste good? Are you in the bad camp? Or is it could be good if you apply some thought to it and don't just copy it for the sake of it? Well, the underlying urge is understandable. We keep doing the same transactions over and over again, so we might as well copy. But it's just the when you're dealing with word processing and when you're dealing with busy people subject to all sorts of constraints, the result is unfortunate. So yes, regarding the notion that contracts can somehow accumulate stuff that doesn't make sense. Yeah, that, there's a kind of pink rat urge or magpie urge that I saw something in this competitor's contract that we don't have, so we must add it to ours. And once something is in a contract, people are very reluctant to take it out because the assumption is someone smarter than me thought this was necessary. I don't have the time or expertise to reverse engineer near the process by which that this got into the contract. So I'm going to leave it there. And there's stuff that just stays in for centuries because of that. So I think of the whole copy and paste system as a system in which very smart people are stuck doing dumb stuff. David Tollin is our next guest. David is the founder of Tech Contracts Academy and Sycamore Legal. He also authored the American Bar Association's manual on IT contracts, the Tech Contracts Handbook, which is the number one bestseller in the ABA's IP section. There's someone in the current world, Dr. Eloise Epstein. She's a partner at Kearney. And she wrote maybe in 2018 and about like the future of procurement. And when she talks about it, and this is maybe one thing I'll contextualize, when she talks about procurement, she's not just talking about sourcing, which I think is fundamentally where a lot of people's minds go when they talk about procurement. She's talking about the entire life cycle. So encapsulating contract management, pre and post signature there. I'm just trying to record a stat and I may be slightly off here, but it was something like she foresees a world in probably the next decade, even with the iteration that AI's had recently of the procurement workforce being reduced by probably up to 80% of workers. And I know from experience that when I've bought in tech that I've not had to hire. And that was pre-AI, right? When as soon as you've got something that can slightly automate parts of the process or data admin is done, you can really reduce the hands doing the work. Is that something, do you think it'll be that severe? for, let's say, legal professionals of lawyers or people like myself, a contract manager working in procurement, can you see that the losses could be like that? I think I have to say the losses could be like that. So it sounds like what she's doing is extrapolating forward. She's looking at the tasks. She's a futurist. Yeah. And she's doing her analysis by extrapolation. She's looking at the tasks that we currently do and looking at the technology's ability to do them and saying probably relatively reasonably, well, we only need, you know, 20% of the staff That's right. to do what's left. I don't find it improbable. I, again, I don't really see it in the next 10 years. And one of the reasons is that as amazingly fast as technology moves, adoption of technology moves slower. It, you still have to yeah. build systems around it and Companies have to get comfortable, and then it's a major investment to adopt it. So I see a slow path. But then the question is, as you get a little bit further out, does her prediction start to turn out? And this gets back to something I was saying at the beginning. Yes, but... There's the prediction is extrapolating based on what's currently known. What is not currently known is what the other activities are that surround the technology that we might not ever have been able to think of. I mean, I'll give you the example of, you know, the rise of, let's say, steam power, 1800 yeah. plus. For a, it put the weavers out of work. So you had these steam powered looms. It didn't overall reduce employment in the long run. You had all these new jobs that were created. There were factory 
foreman and then there were supply positions and there's all this sort of new work that was that surrounded the rise of these factories that was unimaginable so you could easily say in 1790 that the weavers are doomed and get it right but you don't necessarily know what else is going to happen one of the questions is as the technology creates new jobs, who gets them? Is it the old professionals? I mean, the weavers were largely eliminated and it was other people who got the new jobs that were created. Are the new opportunities going to land in the hands of procurement professionals? Another example is bank tellers. You know, people thought when the bank tellers, when ATMs came out, automatic teller machines, we would have no bank tellers. I read recently there's more now per capita than in 1970 before the ATMs. Up next, we have Melinda Deepak Taylor, Global Head of Services Procurement and Vendor Management at Diebold Nixdorf. Melind is a global supply chain, procurement and operations leader with a proven track record in program management, optimizing supply chains and delivering significant cost savings. Do you have any tips on how a procurement professional can build their subject matter expertise because I think sometimes people will default to sort of two things one will be professional qualifications in the procurement space and you know, people have different views of whether that's worthwhile and then secondly it's normally on the job experience but that on the job experience they can sometimes I guess not feel like they're in control of that they're not the masters of their own destiny so I'd be yeah just intrigued from your perspective Melinda there. I think if you look at it from a skill set perspective or how we know of what you mentioned in terms of how we can build that subject matter expertise, one I would say is widen your horizon. For us as procurement professionals, as supply chain professionals, you know, we've been at times being very narrow in terms of only looking at our world. We need to become strategic. You know, if you want to add value, we need to broaden our horizon. We need to, you know, span across functions, break silos and get everyone together. If you are able to develop that collaborative skills, if you are able to get everyone together in the room, connect the dots and complete the picture, you are automatically, you are understanding of not just the procurement, but your understanding of the overall business and how you can impact that would improve. I know it's easier said than that. We have to take small step, think not just on if how is it that it will impact the cost. The question is, how is it that it will impact the organization? How is it that the stuff that I'm doing can help me improve the overall organizational health, you know, be it the revenue, be it the bottom line, right? So that's one mindset change that we need to do. But at the same time, it's also important to keep yourself abreast of what's going on in the industry. If you look at procurement, operating models as well have evolved. The procurement technology has evolved, right? So you have to keep yourself completely up to date with what's going on in the market, what the best in class practices are. And this comes in by a lot of reading, talking to a lot of people, subscribing to the industry journals. And more importantly, the way I learn it is talk to a lot of my suppliers. I ensure that I'll talk to them continuously, understand what's going in their part of the world. What is it that they see coming in? What are the challenges that they are facing and learn from them and try and see if we can bring it back into my world or learn from it and ensure that the learnings from them are shared with the team. And we as a team then become more learned about the overall external environment. We round off this special episode by listening to Dave Jones, who is the co-founder of Procmentum Limited. Dave has over 16 years of leadership in the procurement space across retail, telecom, media and consultancy. He is an MCIPS and passionate about the technology that drives procurement. Like your optimism, so let's continue with that. Dave, I'm really curious last year, and you may not want to be overly specific, but what sort of, what did you enjoy most in your procurement role last year? The breadth increased, so, and it has increased, I think the last, it's actually, I'd go the last two or three years probably since COVID, the breadth of the procurement role has increased massively. So it's moved away just from the process running the procurement process, which a lot of p- businesses were doing. So one where it's a broad range, risk, supplier management, you know, what you guys do at Gatekeeper, contract management, you know, it's a much broader role, which makes it a lot more interesting and exciting and, you know, wide ranging. So that's the thing I've enjoyed. You know, I've enjoyed the most. And what else have I enjoyed? I guess just adding value. So I love what procurement a lot of what I like doing is going into businesses where there might have been a, um, a different relationship with procurement previously, understanding what those misalignments are between what your internal customers or stakeholders want um, versus what the procurement team's doing and then making tweaks to the operating model. I really enjoyed doing that as well. 
for the last year. And I guess just working with really great, I mean, a, a physio who I was working with, really strong, really great consultancy. So it was really good to work with very positive, driven, enthusiastic people. So that was another thing I really enjoyed doing. And also at Yorkshire Water as well, the client was great. Really good board support for the transformation that we were implementing. So it was good. It's been a really positive time. I hope you enjoyed this special episode and found value in the insights provided by our guests. On behalf of Gatekeeper, I would like to thank you for listening and take this opportunity to wish you and your family a happy, healthy and prosperous 2024.